Good to be with you on June, June the 16th, 2024. And this is Sunday School at the Old Church, under Old Country Church. Brother Gene Williams, our assistant pastor, and I have switched. He usually teaches Sunday School on Sunday morning, and I preach. But I'm going to be teaching Sunday School, and he's going to be preaching. So this is Sunday School. This, uh, and I don't, I guess I'm just me. So I, I, it ain't much different. I'm more of a teaching preacher anyway. Than, but, uh, but let's turn to the book of Proverbs. Today is Father's Day. And it's the day we honor all our fathers. It's the day that we can, we can, you know, an official day to say thank you for the nation, to say thank you for the fathers and the job that they do and the role that they accomplish in, in, in children's lives. And it's so important. It's so very critical to our country. It's so very critical to our families and it's critical to our churches that fathers be fathers. And you know how to be a father. That's what we're going to talk about a little bit today about what, what, it, what it is to be a father. Uh, but in the, in the book of uh, Proverbs chapter 1, I'm, I'm sorry, chapter 4, verse 1, Hear ye, children, the instruction of the Father. Now I'm going to read a little bit here. And this is Solomon. This is David's son. And he is, he is he's talking to the children about how to receive something and what to receive from their father. But it, for us today... 3,000 years later, you know, pretty much 3,000 years ago, he wrote this. How, how, how appropriate it is for today. That's amazing. That, that tells you it's God's word. Mm -hmm. Something written 3,000 years ago in a totally different culture, a totally different era, totally different, you know, atmosphere of time mm -hmm. and everything, cultures and everything. It's still appropriate for today. That God's word is forever settled, you know. But it's a way for us to look at this as fathers. To say this is what I need to be to my children. That's another thing. But in Proverbs 4 and 1. Hear ye children the instruction of a father. And attend to no understanding. For I give you good doctrine. Forsake ye not my law or my teachings. For I was my father's son. Tender and only beloved in the sight of my mother. He taught me also and said unto me. Let thine heart retain my words. And keep my commandments and live get wisdom get understanding forget it not neither decline from the words of my mouth forsake her not and she shall preserve thee love her and she shall keep thee wisdom is the principal thing therefore get wisdom and with all thy getting get understanding exalt her and she shall promote thee she shall bring thee to honor when thou dost embrace her she shall give thee, she shall give to thine head an ornament of grace, a crown of glory. She shall deliver to thee. Hear, O my son, and receive my sayings, that the, and the years of thy life shall be many. I have taught thee in the way of wisdom. I have led thee in the right paths. When thou goest, thy steps shall not be straightened. When thou runnest, thou shalt not stumble. Take fast hold of instruction. Let her not go. Keep her, for she is thy life. Instruction is your life. This has so much in it, so much. Fathers, take notice. This is, I'm going to talk about this. I'll say, well, I don't have any kids, or all my kids are grown, or I messed up, my, my, my kids ain't where I can have any influence over. This, we're going, to, we're going to talk about that here in just a minute. It ain't over yet. It ain't over yet. Verse 14, enter not into the path of the wicked, and go not into the way of evil men. Avoid it, and pass not by it. Turn from it and pass away, for they sleep not except they have done mischief, and their sleep is taken away unless they have caused some fall. And they eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. But the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. The way of the wicked is as darkness. They know not at what they stumble. My son, attend to my words. Incline thine ear unto my sayings, and let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. Fathers, if you're that kind of father, and you can you can give this kind of instruction, this is this this this, this helps the family. I mean, this is what creates good, godly, wholesome families. Verse 24. Put away from thee a froward mouth. What does that mean? A smart mouth. Mm -hmm. 
That's, that was the way we would say it today. This, is, this was written, this was translated in 1611. This is the King James Version. In 1611, we don't talk exactly that way, but this, this, we use this version because it's a standard that everything else is judged by, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. So we read that here. Put away from thee a froward mouth, and perverse lips put far from thee. Let thine eyes look right on, straight ahead. And let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder not the path of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand nor to the left, and remove thy foot from evil. You know, the Bible has a whole lot more to say about fatherhood than it does about any, any relationship in the Bible. I mean, we, we, we just had Mother's Day, and we honor our mothers. The hand that rocks the cradle rules the world, pretty much. And we have Mother's Day, we have all this. But as far as the, what the Bible says, he, he, he puts a lot of responsibility upon the fathers all throughout the entire Bible, all the way from Adam, all the way through, completely every one of them. Uh, uh, and we can see some of the evidence. If you look at, you know, who's some of the, who's some of the worst fathers in the Bible, you'll be surprised when I tell you who's one of the worst, I mean, that, because, you know, not everybody was talked about in the Bible, but for, as, from the ones that were, would you believe that King David was one of the worst fathers? He set the worst example for his kids, and he had a lot of children by several wives. That's how he put the country together, by marrying into these families, and they had multiple wives back then, and, and, he, and he put the whole country together, all, all the tribes together, and he made a solid kingdom of Israel. And but but he, you know, he he made a lot of mistakes, and you know what he had he had one of his sons raped his sister. One of his sons, absolutely, that was Amnon, and uh, and one of his son one of his sons uh, rebelled against him and tried to kill his own daddy to take his kingdom away from him. That was Absalom, and there were several instances where those children, you know, showed up. Some of the things that you know cause he would. He was too busy running the kingdom. He was too busy doing this, doing that, doing the other thing. He had his focus on other things other than being a father. But you know what? Today, is, this is, we live in a different time. We're in a New Testament time. And it's time for us to so slow down and, and, and realize our responsibilities to our children. And, uh, but the Bible says so much about being a father and fatherhood. And, about, and, he, and he describes uh, so many times the father's relationship in these stories different times. But that tells you the importance of fatherhood. And what we have right now in our culture, our popular culture right now, they call it pop culture. I never did understand that, but now I understand <laughs> when I was little. But, you know, there's a lot of children that don't have any father figure at all in their life. Now, let me tell you this. There's a lot of different kinds of fathers. But we have, one thing I like about this church, I can tell you right now, and I'm going to speak this to you. We have good, good, good fathers in this church. And you say, well, you're thinking in your mind, except me, because maybe I messed up. And I, well, join the party. <laughs> We've all messed up. We've all come short. But you know what? It ain't all over with yet. You say, well, I, yeah, it is for me, because my kids are gone. I can't never have no relationship with them. Listen, you're not over being a father, because that's the most important thing, because there's more than one kind of father. Look at all them kids back there in that Sunday school class. You got a chance to be fathers to see them. Oh, they already got a father. Well, you can be there. You can be a biological father. You can't do that. Biological father. And then there's fathers that are fathers that didn't have to be. Whether they're stepfathers or just they just took up the role. They 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 didn't. They just they're taking up the responsibility of caring for this child. And you know what? They're just as much a father as a biological father. And then there's and then there's spiritual fathers. There's there's people that. And then a spiritual father is a somebody that they can go to, just like a father. You know, has, has all the characteristics of the father. And, and they can look at you as an example. Mm -hmm. Come on now. Right. See, that's what you got to remember. You know, it's a 24-hour, 365 day a week job. Whenever They can come to you with their troubles, their worries, their problems. 
They can, they can, their questions, their concerns, they, they know and they can look, watch your life and see the honesty and the compassion and the mercy and the grace of God shining through you. And you're, that, that's, a, that's a spiritual father. You lead them into a closer walk with God, that's a spiritual father. And you're just as much a father as anybody else. What's what we're talking about here? Fatherhood. Not daddyhood. Not being a daddy baby. We're talking about being a father. Now, uh, let's go to Proverbs chapter 23, verse 24. <coughs> the father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that begetteth a wise child shall have joy of him. That's a good thing right there. We need to, we need to try to interject wisdom into our children. That's what, the, that's what chapter 4 talks about, the whole chapter. <coughs> get wisdom. And with wisdom, I mean, with all you're getting, get understanding. If we can teach our children some wisdom, I mean, it's good for them to be smart. It's good for them to be academically smart. You know, books and all that. It's good for them to have a trade and have, a, have an ability to do this or that. But the, work, the, the, the most important, I think, uh, thing that, that we need to try to promote in their lives is wisdom. I know some people that's real smart and ain't got a thimble full of wisdom. <laughs> Without wisdom, it don't matter how smart you are. If wisdom was dynamite, it wouldn't blow a match out. <laughs> and, 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 but that's the most important. I, I, the father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice and he that begetteth a wise child shall have great joy. Amen. So, we need to do that. When I said we have good fathers here, I didn't say we had perfect fathers. They never made mistakes. We've all made mistakes in raising children. Amen. But fathers, we, what I'm saying is we've got a church full of people here, fathers, that whether you're biological or a father didn't have to be or stepfather or blended families or whatever it is, you've taken on the role of being a father to these children, man, I'm going to tell you something. That shows me that you've changed. You, If you change and you, you look back and see a, a trash heap, you know, maybe behind you maybe or something, or you see mistakes <coughs> that you wish you could go back and, re, and fix some way or another. Amen. But you know what that tells you? That you're going in the right direction because it's in your rear view mirror. Amen. It's not forward. Amen. Going forward is what we need to think about today. Going forward. From this day on, I'm going to be a good father. I'm going to find a child. I'm going to find somebody. It don't have to be a young, young, young child. It could be a teenager. It could be a whole around. It don't have to be in this church. It could be somebody that you have, maybe your neighbor or, or, or some other relative, a nephew or a niece or something like that. But you can be the father figure and be that example and show the characteristics of a good father. You can become a spiritual father to somebody. And there's a lot of needed opportunities out there. Yes. There's a lot of need and there's a lot of opportunities. Amen. So many scriptures talk about fathers. About, you know, give us this instruction. Ephesians chapter 6. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. And you may not understand all those words, but, but don't, you know, a lot of children are provoked to rebellion. When he says don't, don't provoke them to wrath, it means don't provoke them to anger. In other words, and, and, and don't, don't provoke them to just be rebellion. Because, and you can do that real easy by making unneeded rules and regulations that everybody has to live by, having mm -hmm. super harsh punishment over this, that, and the other thing. And you just, uh, he that is, you know, often corrected, stiffens his neck, you know, the Bible says. And, and I just, I, I know I'm going to get it, and I don't care. Just, I'm going to do what I want to and take the lick. And that's a rebellious spirit. And guess, you can, if you ain't careful, you can look back and see because of your harsh punishment, harsh rules, and lack of compassion, lack of love, unattainable goals. I'll never be able to be good enough to make my daddy proud of me. Don't ever be like that. Come on now. That's right. 
accept and love and have to cherish and have compassion and mercy on them children. They was a, they talk about, you know, talking about being like a domineering person. There was three guys sitting at a restaurant. They used to go there for breakfast, you know, in the morning, sitting around, you know. Like old, used to do at Longview restaurant up here, all the old guys sitting there, they had a big long table, and it was the gossip, gossip corner spark. You want to know what's going on? Don't read the newspaper, go to Longview for breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's three old guys sitting at a place like that, and they was talking about, yeah, I got my wife under control, I got my family, yeah, but I do this, do that, and I holler, get me some sweet tea, and she goes, get And the other said, well, yeah. He said, I'm going to tell you, I got it better than that. I can tell my wife what I want to eat before I come home. It'll be sitting on the table when I can get there. She knows better not to. That third guy, he was just sitting there. He wasn't saying nothing, just listening. They looked over at him and said, well, what about you? You got your wife under control? He said, I had her on her hands and knees coming to me yesterday. How'd you do that? He said, I said well, she was on her hands and knees. He says, get out of that bed and fight like a man. <laughs> <laughs> Being a father don't mean you're the big boss. A lot of times, kids, you can scream and holler at them and they just turn you off. Because you scream and holler at them too much. My youngins know, and when I get loud, it's time, it's time to hunt somewhere to go. You know, that soft, quiet, authority of gentleness and meekness and all the spooks of the spirit they create an atmosphere where you can actually input wisdom into them children real important our popular culture is at odds with raising kids in a godly way nurture and admonition nurture them with God you're nourishing them you're, you're causing them to have an appetite for God you hear me yes when you nourish your children, that means in the nurture, that means nourishing, you're, you're causing them to have an appetite that only God can satisfy. Mm -hmm. This is good teaching. Amen. Amen. And admonition, that means God says don't do that. It's not just daddy. It's not just daddy's rules. It's not just the Hawkins family rules. God ain't pleased with that, and that's important here. That means bringing them up, nourishing them with the food of God, causing them to have an appetite for the things of God, and then saying, admonishing them, saying, no, God's not pleased with that, and that's important. It is. That's ultimately important. So that's what I'm talking about. Joshua chapter 24. See, I can do a lot of scriptures when I'm just teaching. I didn't have these marks or anything. I figured you just get there for I did anyway. Yeah. I should have marked it again. Joshua chapter 24. Uh, this is Joshua is making a statement. Because our popular culture is at odds with everything we want to treat our children. If they're on TikTok and on YouTube, they're learning stuff entirely opposite of what you're trying to instill in them godly, godly values. I mean, I mean, it's just designed that way. The, the movies and the things, a lot, of, a lot of stuff, this culture is pushing our children away from God at all times because the devil, Satan, the old dragon, the old red dragon, old scratch, whatever you want to call him, he's he, Lucifer, the, the, the devil from hell that was cast out of heaven because of his rebellion. He's trying to put rebellion on this whole world because by, uh, Paul said, and the God of this world. Amen. He was cast down to the earth and, and Adam and Eve had dominion over everything, but they gave up the dominion over this world because of sin. Now the devil has dominion over this physical world that we're living in and that's, that's a terrible thing. But you know what? We are going against the current. We're, we're, we're pushing against that. Jesus came and died 
and was resurrected on our for us on our behalf to set us back in right state with God like we was intended to be from the Garden of Eden from the very beginning. Because sin is what separates us from God and he took away that sin and, and nailed it to the cross and the blood of Jesus saves us from all sin and unrighteousness and puts us back in relationship with God and that means we're a bright and shining light in the middle of a whole lot of darkness. Yes. But we've got to we've got to enforce that light. And not just on Sundays. We've got to enforce that light every day because, you know, you're, I heard a preacher say a long, long, I mean, 30, 40 years ago, that you're affecting somebody whether you know it or not. Mm -hmm. That's right. You're influencing somebody whether, you know, whether you're saved or not, you're influencing somebody because somebody is watching you. Oh, yeah. Maybe different people at different times, but somebody's always watching you. Yes. And you're either influencing them for God or you're influencing them to the wrong, to the devil. That's right. Because you've got to serve one. Mm -hmm. There's no in-between. You can't coach. Right. If you're not a, if you're not serving God, if you're not a child of God, guess what? The Bible says you're a child of hell. That's right. Yep. So you need to understand that. That's a very important point. But Joshua made a declaration here, and this is what I want our fathers just to. to uh, a fresh in the news. Maybe you made this declaration over and over, over, over the course of time. But this is a, this is Father's Day. This is the day for our fathers to make a brand new declaration. God's wanting people to stand up and declare, "I'm part of the kingdom of God. I am a child of the King." You need to. I need to speak your identity into you. You know what? We're going to talk about that here in just a second. But we need to speak that identity into yourself and and make a declaration. I am. I'm going to be a kingdom father. Because this is that's exactly what. Joshua is saying here in verse 24 of the last chapter, verse, chapter 24, verse 24. Or no, verse 15, I'm sorry, verse 15. If it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in, those, in whose land you dwell. But here's, here's his declaration. But as for me, I can't speak for you, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. That's a declaration. Yes. My goodness. And we need some people that will stand up and put the flag in the ground, put their feet solid, and, amen, shoulder width apart, and, amen, and get ready for the, for the devil to come against them and say, listen, as for me and my house, my whole house, not just me, but my whole house. Everybody I've got influence over. Everybody I've got authority over. Everybody I have responsibility over. We are going to serve the Lord. Because they were living in the lands of the Amorites. You see that? You see that in that verse? Oh, the gods of the Amorites? In other words, their popular culture was there to, to try to... You Listen, here, write this down. Don't let where you live dictate the decisions you make. Don't let the culture around you dictate the decisions you make about your whether that's your home and your family and all of that. Because it's okay. Everybody else is doing it. Well, that don't make it okay. That's right. Just because everybody's doing it. More than likely, it's probably not okay. Mm -hmm. Because that's because the culture is dominated and, and overruled by the God of this world. Who's that? Lucifer the devil. That's right. Don't let the place where you're living. Define the decisions that you make. God is going to hold you responsible for that declaration. You're going to say, hey, me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Now, we talk about a lot of different things about fatherhood, and I had this question this week. In Matthew <coughs> chapter 23, verse 9, you can turn it if you want to, but everybody knows the scripture. Call no man father on this earth, because you have one father who is in heaven. Now, this is 1611, King James Version. And uh, things meant just a little bit different in some some words. And 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 I'm going to explain this real quick. So because uh, my daddy would never let me call him up by I, I, he was always dad. He was, I, I'm not your father. You have one father in heaven. You know, he, <coughs> well, he correct you in a second like that. But that's really missing the the whole meaning of that because he says don't don't call don't call anybody else your father. In other words. What he, who he was dealing with right there was, a, was a, a sect or a group of very highly religious people called the Pharisees. That's who he was addressing in this and, and, and he was talking about. 
because they, they were all the time, they wore certain garments and they had to have certain length and certain fringe on their things and, and, they, and they would make prayers in the, in, the, in, the, in the middle of the street and how holy they were. And they were, they were always after titles. They were always wanting to be, you know, another step up on the rung other than somebody else. They were always wanting this authority over somebody. They was always wanting this prestige of, call me Father. In other words, I have authority over you spiritually. He said, don't, don't let nobody else have that. He said, God is your, is your judge. In other words, don't, let, don't say to somebody else, don't let somebody here have the, the ultimate authority over your life and call them the Father. Because we have one Father which is in heaven. In other words, don't, let them, don't, don't look at them as your source because your source comes from God. The source of what? The source of everything. Everything that I have. He's my source. What it meant was don't call nobody rabbi or master. That's what they want to call. Father, rabbi, you know. But the power of, the, of a father in our, in our community right here to influence their children is one of the <coughs> tremendous powers that we have as human beings. Children desperately, desperately, desperately need to feel an earthly father's love. Whether you're a spiritual father or are you just have an opportunity to have an influence over somebody, whether it's they may be 18, that maybe 20, maybe 30 years old, but you're the, you can be their spiritual father. And they definitely need they desperately need to see the love of an earthly father for them to be able to conceive and comprehend the love of a heavenly father. That's right. Because we are the examples of what God should be. We should be the reflection of God. I was so fortunate that my father He's done. He, he's having the best Father's Day there is today. He, he's 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 rejoicing in the presence of God. Yes. But I had a good father that taught me, and 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 he was he was he he admonished me with, and he nurtured me. It just exactly like the Bible said to do. And and I look at him, and that I wished I could attain to as good as he was. But look how I turned out. <laughs> but now he he was a he was a good father. And, and he, uh, we desperately need, he showed me, he showed me the love and would help me to understand God's love. Yes. You see what I mean? If, if a child never sees a father vulnerable, hear me now, and, and just showing their love unrestrained, then they'll never understand fully what it means. Charles Stanley was talking about he he'd been preaching for a long time, and he but he said there was something missing, and he got some people together in Colorado. And he he said I, I, he wrote down several pages his whole life story, what happened to him. His father died, and he was just so many months old or whatever. And uh, and one of them said after the, after he got through that, make a real long story short. He said he said put your hands on the table. And he said shut your eyes. And he said something about uh, I want you to feel God putting His arm around you and loving you right now. And when he did that, in a few minutes, he started weeping and crying. And he said that was the first time. I would see, he'd never had a father. And he said it felt like God himself just put me in his arms and just put his hand over my head. You're protected. You're secure. You're whole. You're, you're valued. You're loved. You're complete. He said, I've been preaching big churches for years and never had felt that, that intense. And he said he just wept and wept and wept. You know, there's something about the tender mercies of God. And we, as fathers, you need to show the tender mercies of God. <clears throat> Amen? What's the characteristics of a good father? Can I go through a few of them with you real quick? Number one is dependability. They need to be, you need to be able to depend on your father. He's going to be there for you. Number two is compassion. They need to see that a father is not only, you know, the disciplinarian, the authoritarian, the boss, but he also has compassion. What does that mean? Being supportive in times of bad, bad times. They need to see an honest father. That's one of the characteristics of being a good father, is being honest. Another characteristic is being protected. <clears throat> you protect your family, you protect them. You know that, that my father's going to protect me. See, all these are characteristics of God. He's dependable. He's honest. He has compassion, and he'll protect you. 
And he'll support you in rough, bad times. See, you're reflecting the, 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 the nature of God. That's nurturing them and admonishing them in God. They are affectionate. A good father is affectionate. He ain't always hard and unapproachable. A good father can be, hey, yeah, come on, give me a hug. Do that. Watch, watch some of those chains break off of children when you start, and when you start doing that. Empathy. I'm not going through what they're going through because I lived. My, I, I was in. I was in middle school there in the seventies. So we're a whole lot different time now. So I, I can't sympathize with them, but I can empathize with them. you know. And you can show them that I really feel what you're feeling the best I can. And I'm. I'm going to take. I'm, you know. You know that empathy that you have with them. Encouraging. A good father is encouraging. It's not always everything. Something's wrong all the time. You need to do this. You do that. This and that and other thing. It's. I'm encouraging you. You're doing a good job. I'm proud of you. Encouraging. A good father can encourage you. A good father values the mother. Supports the mother. It's a team. The number one thing, one of the number one characteristics of a good, of a good father is they see love. Genuine, not put on, not because you have to, or whether you're a spiritual father to somebody or a father figure to somebody, you can show that love. That, and you know what you're doing? You're reflecting. You're, re, you're saying, if you, when, you, when, you, when you get big enough, if they're a little bitty, if you get big enough to where you want to get right with God, or listen, when you, if, you're, if, you're already, if they're already a Christian, you're, just, you're showing them the love of God, they're saying, that's how Father. <clears throat> if, if, if an earthly father can love you, Jesus said this, your earthly father loves you so much, Look how much more God can love you. And it's just everything intensified from God. And they understand that. Now, I'm going to the last few minutes here, I'm going to hurry with this. But this is the main part. The most important responsibility that a father has. Anybody here want to guess what it is? Oh, providing, inspiring, all that stuff. The no, I mean, that, those are, you've got to do all those things. But the number one Responsibility. Now get me now. Number one responsibility for a father is to cast a vision, a godly vision, into their children. Yes. But you can't cast or give something that you ain't got. Mm -hmm. You got to have a vision. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, uh, without a vision, the people perish. Without a vision. We need to get the vision of who we want our family to be. Uh, who who we know we got to have a vision of who God is, who Jesus is. Hey Amen. To have to have that Jesus restores and re, and puts everything back together. We need to understand. We get to get that vision. What is vision? Or, or casting a vision involves painting a vivid picture of what tomorrow could look like. When you cast a vision on the child, you say, "This is what your your future, a preferred future, could be." And they, and they, you know what? We always, the problem is we've got so many, we've got generations of people where the fathers didn't take that as an important virtue to cast a, vi a godly vision into their children. And so they didn't, they didn't have a vision themselves and the children didn't get the vision. Now we've got chaos ruling the world and everything's going crazy because somebody didn't get a vision of who Jesus is. You know, if you, if you look at the book Pilgrim's Progress, that guy, you know what the number one thing all the way through that whole book is? He looked at and he called it Yon Wicked Gate. I, I mean, I read the original. Yon Wicked Gate. He's looking at the kingdom of God, and that's where I'm going. Whatever I got to do to get there, whatever the slow of despond and all the marshes and all the all the weeds and the lines and everything else, I, I keep my eye on that. And if we'll get the vision of what, what Jesus is, and we cast that vision into our children, we'll have a church that'll keep on going till the Lord comes. But without that vision, unless a father cast a vision, I want everybody here, that's the most important thing. I want you to understand that that's so important. To vision. What is a vi what is vision? To a the ability to see God's plan and God's purpose. God's got a plan. Now, there's so many places. Jesus is one of the great examples of casting a vision. You know what he did, and it's all about just who he was. He did, he didn't have to he didn't have to preach about it or, or you know have a big he he had the vision that he just radiated from him because he just walked past the boys fishing in a boat. 
Peter and Andrew standing there pulling up nets. He looked at me and said, boys, I'll make you fishers of men. Come follow me. They dropped everything and left with him. Why? Because he had a vision. He was able to cast that vision to them. That's the example I want. Now, if you go to John, uh, it has to get inside of, of our children. It has to be inside of you before it gets to the children. John chapter 17, verse 24, real fast. John chapter 17, verse 24. Thank you. What was that? Yeah, 24 and 24. Father, there you got that word, Father, I will that they also, whom thou hast given me, be with me where I am. Oh, man. That they may behold thy glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, everybody say Father. Father. The world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and I'm casting that vision of thee into them. You hear me? They have not known me, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me, and I have, what? Declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherein thou hast loved me may be in them, not on them, not when they go to church, but inside them. Can anybody say Holy Ghost? Man. Holy Ghost. The love wherein thou hast loved me may be in them and I in them. Yes. Jesus said, me and my Father are one. I'm in him and he's in me. You can't separate us. That's right. My goodness, ain't that good? I can, I can talk to you about Galatians chapter 4 verse 17 talks about crying, Abba, Father. You know what? He's not just a, the Father figure standing up here. When you're being a father... Be able to be dad. Hey, dad. You know what? That's what that's what that word means. That's a Hebrew word for for a very intimate relationship with your father. Abba. Hey, hey, daddy. Daddy. I need this. I'm 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 hurting. I got a I got a boo boo. Anybody here had a boo boo? Ain't it good to have somebody that is just saying, "Well, father, I need thou to." I, your son needest thou to get a band-aid. <laughs> no. Daddy, 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 look at here. He says, oh, hon, let me fix that. Let me get, here, I do a piece of it. <laughs> that's the God who, that's what we've got to reflect. Yeah. We're sinful by nature. Okay, that's we are. You don't have to teach your child to do wrong. You just let them live long enough and they'll be able to come out. Because we're sinful by nature. And sin keeps us from the Heavenly Father. But Jesus, when he came and gave his, his life and his death and his resurrection, restores everything we lost through sin. The, the, he restores the believer back to the original state where God intended us to be. Having his spirit inside us, whenever we get the Holy Ghost and his spirit is inside of us, that grants us the right of being God's child. His spirit inside us says, okay. Just like Jesus, I'm me and my father are one. Well, wouldn't you? That's, you, want, you want to cast a vision to your child? You want to cast a godly vision into this community? You get, you get, you get that vision yourself that me and, oh, I'm in the Father and He's in me and, and I'm in Him and, and He's in me and I'm in Him and He's in me and I'm in Him and He's in me. My God, it just goes in the big long circle and say, whoo, my God, you'll, have, you'll walk out of here glowing. Amen. When you when you get that that vision, that belief, and you just keep your eye on heaven, I ain't missing it. If you really believe there is a heaven, you'll do everything you can to make it. Yes. Amen. You don't believe it. Apparently, some people don't just don't. They say, "Oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I believe. I, I kind of I believe about." No, you don't. If you really believe that there is a hell and there's demons that that you, they're unimaginable, and the horror and the and the length of eternity is it's can't be comprehended by the human mind. You would do everything you can to get a right, right, right relationship with God. But we can be His children. We have the opportunity right now. Mm -hmm. Now, being God's child grants you the right to call Him Abba Father. You, you got gives you the right to say when you're God's child, you can say, "Daddy, I've got a problem here. 
I messed up. Can you forgive me? Or whatever. Knowing that we are his children, we are supposed to live the way he wants us to. How's that? Yes. Holy. Amen. As his child, you know you have his blessing. Praise God. Put his hand on Well, I hope you enjoyed it. Got a little out of that. Amen. Amen.